We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. Hi, I'm Yue Xu. And I'm Julie Kraftchik. We are active daters turned dating sociologists. Here to dive into everything modern dating and relationships. Welcome to the Dateable Podcast. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the Dateable Podcast. We are here for another week to indulge in all that is modern dating because we can never get enough of it even if we're not dating ourselves. <laughs> Never get enough of it. You know, after seven years, you would think that we'd run out of topics, but they always present themselves all the time. And, you know, this episode, I'm really excited about this one because we've been a partner with One Love Foundation for quite a while. You've probably mm -hmm. heard us reference them. They are a nonprofit that helps you navigate if your relationship is healthy or unhealthy and ultimately helps if you find yourself in a situation of abuse. So we are all for their content. It's totally free. It's such a great resource. And we wanted to have Abella, one of their team members, come on the podcast to talk about the real red flags we should be looking for. Because we know that red flags is such a hot topic. Ironically, both UA and I are both wearing red right this minute as we do this intro. Unplanned. Ish. Orange. Orange red. So we are in the red flag theme for all intents and purposes. But we had an episode last season, Capture the Red Flag, that was... Was that last season? Yeah, season 15, uh, episode 8. It's like a lifetime ago. Totally does, doesn't it? On our Spotify Unwrapped, this showed up as the most popular episode that we had on Spotify. Not surprised because so many of you, so many of you say, oh, I could have avoided that if I had seen the red flags from the beginning. We're constantly on this red yeah. flag hunt. But this episode uncovers the real red flags, the red flags that matter and determine whether your relationship is healthy or unhealthy. And in this conversation, we also talk about what is healthy, the green flags. Yeah. <laughs> we forget that sometimes. We always forget the green flags. Yeah, I'm really glad we're diving into this because, you you know, UA and I have our opinion on people always saying red flag, but I ultimately do believe red flags are important to look out for. What happens, though, is we diminish the real ones when we're mm -hmm. constantly looking for things that don't matter. We've heard people say like, oh, they chew with their mouth open, red flag, or they have no friends, red flag. And like, maybe that's a red flag, but maybe it's just the situation that they're in. So... This one's really good because we have an expert. We have someone that can really dissect all the learnings that they've had. Yeah, she's just so wonderful to talk to. And we both learned a thing or two about our unhealthy behaviors in our own relationships. Yes. So that was good to know. I was like, oh, I should probably stop doing that or saying that. Yeah, well, she said something that has stuck with me. We'll obviously get into way more detail the episode, but everyone has unhealthy patterns and behaviors. That's natural. We were never taught how to do relationships, how to love, how to be with another person. We did not learn this in school, especially if we've been single for a while. It can be challenging. But what differentiates it is, does it become a pattern? Are you unwilling to work on it? Are there many unhealthy behaviors? But we did find a few that we both held. So, yes, spoiler. Yes, <laughs> yes. 
Not surprised at all, but it is nice to understand whether you're in a healthy relationship or not. And speaking of a healthy relationship, I was at the Magic Castle this week. (laughs) That's the definition of a healthy relationship. (laughs) The definition of a healthy relationship. And Cindy Crawford was there with her husband. Oh, my God. And her daughter. They were the sweetest. The two of them were so affectionate. And I don't I don't know much about Cindy Crawford's private life, so I had to look it up thinking she's probably been married like five times like every other supermodel. She's been with this husband. Richard Gere was her first, but she's been with this one for over 20 years. They look madly in love still. And she oh. sat right next to us during a show. She and my partner's legs were touching. And so I hope that wow. some of that like healthy, you know, that healthy relationship <laughs> Secrets have been passed to us <laughs> through t- transferring from leg touching. I was just so starstruck <laughs> because she still looks so incredible. She's 57 years old, but wow. hasn't changed a bit. Just the most beautiful like aura about her, even just her presence. She's so confident. Like, yes. Only goals, in L.A. Goals. <laughs> <laughs> All the goals. Is she with a normal person, like not someone in the entertainment business? I would say he's a normie-ish. He's definitely rich. He's a businessman, but he's not an okay. actor or anything. He modeled for a little bit, but he's a, he's just like a, your businessman kind of thing. And, and she had both okay. kids with him. So they, they seem just like a normal family. Got it. That probably helps. Yeah. A normal family, you know, with a supermodel in it. But who invited me to the Magic Castle is a, child, a, a family friend's son. We grew up together. His name is Joe, and he brought his girlfriend, Sarah, who's been listening to our podcast. Oh, so I just want to say hi to Sarah. Welcome to our podcast. It was so nice meeting you and so happy that you're enjoying the show. (laughs) Wait, I have a very important question for you. Of course. Magic Castle. This is where they do like magic shows, right? Like, I feel like I've seen this before. It's such a weird... It's such an interesting experience. It's a members only club for magicians. And that's been around forever in Hollywood. But if you know a member, you get invited to dinner or you can do a brunch there. There's a full restaurant and like three bars. But throughout the night, there are different magic shows going on. And you go from room to room or you could be sitting next to a magician at the bar and the magician could be like, do you want to see a trick? And then they would just do some magic tricks for you. Interesting. Yeah. It's a really incredible experience. And you can go pretty much all night. The, The last show ends at 1230 or it starts at 1230. They have a headliner show too. And it's just everybody is a magician or believes in magic. So I saw, I don't know, I'm like now blanking on the name of the show, but it was one of this Netflix show, you might remember it a long time ago, it was about this like nerdy guy and he ends up dating this girl that is kind of just like a hipster, like hot girl, right? Like that stereotype. And they go on a date to Magic Castle, like that's their first date. And that's all I can think about. I'm blanking on the name of the show, so it's not getting, the story is not great, mm. but hmm. I do have this memory <laughs> imprinted about the Magic Castle because of this TV show. I've never been before. It's a TV show? Yeah, it's just like one scene of the TV show that they go to Magic Castle, <laughs> like this is their big date. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> All good. Not important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm glad Cindy Crawford bodies a healthy relationship, so props to her. Who knows what's going on in private, but you know, externally, I'm like, <laughs> yes, couple goals. That is a good point, though, is like, who knows what's going on in private? Because both of us have a mutual friend that we thought things were great for so long Mm, to learn that it wasn't. And a lot of times, you know, this episode is really important. One, if you're, we're bringing it back to the episode. We're going away from Cindy Crawford for a second. We're bringing it back. (laughs) But (laughs) if you're clearly dating, you want to be on the lookout. But if you're in a relationship, a lot of times things that you maybe wrote off at the beginning is not being a big deal or you know everyone has flaws or I got so caught up in just how hot and attractive and funny this person was that I ignored some signs of how they treat 
me. So this episode, I think, will help everyone. But it's a really lonely place to be when you feel like you can't share it with people either. Because Mm -hmm. talking about your fights with your partner is kind of a double-edged sword. On one side, it's healthy to talk to other people, get different perspectives. But then on the other side, like every partnership does have some conflict. So even Mm -hmm. if you are the healthiest of relationships, by all intents and purposes, you're still going to have fights and conflict. So how much do you share with your friends? Like this is kind of the age old debate. Nothing. Share absolutely nothing. (laughs) There's no debating in my eyes. Just share nothing. But things do come out. I mean, honestly, things do come out and you have to take the advice with a grain of salt. I went on a girl's trip this past weekend to Paso Robles and we were like, you know, college girlfriends. And after a few drinks, you do end up spilling the beans on some of your relationship details. And it was really therapeutic for me. But at the same time, I have to be like, okay, what do I want to absorb? And what do I just, you know, accept? But it's, it's not relevant to me. It's hard. It's hard to draw that line. I think it depends on the extent of what you're going through, though. You know, like, I feel like I get why you wouldn't want to say something until, like, a lot of times once it's over, that's when everything comes out, right? Yeah. Because it's done. But I... I get that because if you're still trying to work through it, you don't want to taint your friend's perspectives and all that. But if you really are finding yourself in a bad situation, you know, isolating from friends and not sharing is not good approach either. Like you just internalize so much at that point. I mean, clearly a therapist is the best approach because it's an external person that you can talk to that isn't going to judge your relationship. Right. But I do think you need to get it out somehow or like maybe there's a trusted friend or someone. I remember it was the episode we did with Vienna and Connor. I'll always refer to this episode of how to have a healthy relationship. I remember them saying that they had a friend that they both were friends with that they would talk to and they would view it through the lens of the relationship not Mm. each other. And I think that is a good approach if you can find someone like that, that can put away the behavior, but also be like, is this good for you in the relationship? Um, Truthfully, it's really hard to find a friend like that. Very hard. (laughs) Yeah, very hard. (laughs) I talk to my friends because I'm looking for people to back me up. Sometimes it can feel very lonely when you are in a disagreement with your partner because you feel like you are alone in processing that, right? So you want your friends to back you up. You want them to validate you. Their job is to set you up for therapy. (laughs) I really think it's passing the baton. I I just find a neutral friend or a, a a neutral or mutual friend who can be really objective and for both of you is so damn hard. Wouldn't you rather just pay someone? Just pay someone. I think this is one of those situations, but not everyone has that at their disposal. So I do want to call that out that like you have to find what works for you. I mean, luckily in today's world, there's so many options of accessible therapy. Clearly we sponsor BetterHelp, not sponsored by them, but you know, there are (laughs) options. Not sponsored on this episode, but they are an overarching, but clearly One Love, One Love Foundation, you can Mm. get resources there. So there are ways to do this. But again, I, I believe it has to do with the extent of what's going on in your relationship. Like if you feel like your relationship is abusive, I I don't know if holding it in is the right answer. I don't believe that is either. Yeah, we should never hold anything in. Yeah. So we go through a lot in this episode, but we didn't actually get to touch on some stats that Mm. Abella, who's our guest today, was able to give us. So I do want to run through these stats. You know, we're talking about unhealthy relationships, but a lot of times unhealthy relationships end up being abusive relationships. Not all unhealthy relationships will be abusive, but some are. So more than one in three women in the U.S., 36.4%, have experienced some form of intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Mm. It's a lot. Wow. But then also one in three men in the U.S., 33.6%, have experienced some form of intimate partner violence in their lifetime. I think that's important to call out because we often think it's men on women. And that isn't the case. Mm -hmm. We never talk about the reverse. And these are just reported stats too. Yeah, that's a good point. So many people probably were too scared to report 
Yep. And then one in two trans non-binary people in the U.S., 54%, have experienced some form of intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Wow. That's a crazy number. 46% of American, Indian, Native, Alaskan, non-Hispanic women in the U.S. have experienced some form of intimate partner violence in their lifetime. It's an interesting stat. They broke it out that way. Yeah. And then 43.7 of Black non-Hispanic women have also experienced some form of intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Yikes. Yeah. Well, the goal of this episode is maybe you think, well, I've never been in a violent relationship or physically abusive relationship. The goal of this episode is to help you recognize signs so that it doesn't get to that point. I think many times we think that's not us. That's not me. That's not our situation. But these signs do do accumulate over time and they compound. And when it gets to that physical abusive phase, that's when it's really bad. We don't want these stats to go up even more. So this episode applies to everyone because it's just starting yeah. from the many symptoms of an unhealthy relationship all the way to the more drastic symptoms. Yeah. And I mean, I have multiple friends that I don't believe were in abusive relationships in the sense of physical, but it yeah. was emotional abuse and it really wore on their self esteem, their self worth. So Clearly, at Dateable, we are proponents of relationships. We love love, but also we don't want you to be in the wrong relationship or a bad relationship Mm. for you. Being single is still way better than having someone that's chipping at your self-esteem and causing anguish in your life. True. Truth in that. Well, we're going to get into it in a lot more detail with Abella. But before we do, at Dateable Podcast, that's where you can find us on Instagram. Make sure to drop us a rating and review. We're trying to get to that 1K. We are slowly but surely getting there. So, so close. Need your support. Thank you in advance. That will help us so much. Help us continue to get great guests like Bella and keep this podcast going. Yes. Okay. Well, before we get into it with Abella, let's hear a quick message from our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes. Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow. It will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the high love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at viahemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to viahemp.com and use the code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's viahemp.com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. This episode is made possible by Badlands Pets. As you all know, Mojo, my precious baby, is the reason why I found love in the first place. He made me feel love again. So I would do anything to ensure his health and longevity. And actress Katherine Heigl, and I have that in common, she's helped save over 16,000 dogs through her foundation. And after doing a ton of research, she feels there's one place we can look to to improve any dog's health, and that's their food. So fortunately, she found that just by adding a few special superfoods to her dog's food, she saw huge transformations in their health. So she's made a 20-minute video explaining step-by-step how anyone can do the same thing to see incredible changes in their dog's health. I've definitely re-looked at what I'm feeding Mojo and making sure that he only has one life to live and I want to make sure it's the best damn life. So if you want to keep your dog healthy and happy, go to badlandsfood.com slash dateable and watch Catherine's video right now. Again, that's B-A-D-L-A-N-D-S-F-O-O-D.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. 
This episode is made possible by Armoire. Armoire makes getting dressed easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, build the perfect wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. All you have to do is take a five-minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out. Listen, I live in Southern California. There is absolutely no need for puffer coats or any sort of those winter jackets. But when I travel anywhere else in the world in these cold months, I'm often burdened with the task of getting winter clothes. And now with Armoire, I can just rent my winter wardrobe. It's brilliant. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125. off. Just visit armoire.style slash datable. That is armoire.style spelled A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try armoire today. Okay, let's hear it from Abella about the real red flags to watch out for. What is a healthy relationship? And the better question is, what is an unhealthy relationship? It's very easy for us to look at someone else's relationship and say, hmm, doesn't look very healthy. (laughs) But when we're in it ourselves, it's harder to understand what we call sometimes the red flags, the warning signs, and what you may think is okay or acceptable may be signs of an unhealthy relationship. So today we're going to get to some concrete answers as to what is unhealthy and what is healthy. We're diving into this topic with our guest today, Abella Onyema from the One Love Foundation, which is a national nonprofit organization with the goal of ending relationship abuse. One Love empowers young people with the tools and resources they need to see the signs of healthy and unhealthy relationships and bring life saving prevention education to their communities. Hi, Abella. Nice to see you. Thanks for being on our show. Hi, you guys. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. This is a total, total treat for me. I love the podcast. It's a treat for us. (laughs) Yes. Feeling is mutual. Who is Abella? She is 41 years old, lives in Brooklyn, originally from Chicago. She's pretty single and has been taking a dating sabbatical. You, along with many other singles right now. (laughs) (laughs) Dating is brutal out there. Sometimes you need to take care of yourself. You get a rest. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Mental health first. Exactly. Exactly. That's so, so real. (laughs) And while we're on the topic of what is healthy versus unhealthy, what do you think are some of the high level differences between what differentiates the two? So at One Love, we have what we call the 10 signs of an unhealthy relationship and the 10 signs of a healthy relationship. And it's my favorite thing that we offer to the world because it just then makes things really clear. I think we live in a society that loves to say things like, oh, that that relationship or that person's so toxic Mm -hmm. or that person's Mm. trash or whatever. And we use these like really vague words that are so common as to almost mean nothing. Right. And so when you really distill it down, okay, these are the 10 signs of an unhealthy relationship. Now, when you name it, you can know it and you can do something about it. So those things would be intensity, when someone expresses very extreme feelings and over-the-top behavior, or possessiveness, when someone is really jealous to the point where they're trying to control your time, or isolation, when someone tries to keep you away from your friends and family, right? So there's this whole list of 10 things that we think are red flags to look out for. So let's get into that, because I think we're all like dying Mm -hmm. to know what are the those 10 things. I mean, you know, I think when we think of unhealthy, Mm -hmm. we go to abuse, but there's more than just that. So yeah, let's dive into it. I love that you said that, Julie, because I do think that people let these flags slide until they escalate or until they grow to the point of being abused. Right. So every relationship is a mix of healthy and unhealthy behaviors. And not every unhealthy relationship will turn abusive, but every abusive Mm -hmm. relationship starts unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So it's important Mm -hmm. 
to have an eye out for these things when they are relatively small so that you can address them with your partner or decide that maybe this partnership isn't the right thing for you. And when I say partner, I'm talking about a long-term partner, someone you're hooking up with, talking to, situationship, Mm -hmm. even a friend, right? Any manner of relationship that you might be in can be healthy or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we're looking out for are belittling. That's another one of the 10 signs. Mm. Someone saying things or doing things to make you feel really bad about yourself. And you would think like, well, yeah, I would never be with someone that would talk down to me. But belittling can be so slick. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be so (laughs) corrosive. It could be something like, it's cool that you didn't get that promotion. I mean, you're not really the corporate ladder type or whatever, right? Like oh, some, very some subtle. kind of like thing. Yeah. It's subtle, right? It's like, oh, that's not that big a deal. And then, but it's like a dig at you. Like, yeah. am I just like a not ambitious, like whatever? Like, what does that even mean? So it might be like a subtle dig that just chips away at you and chip, chip, chip away at you. Mm-hmm. Because very few people would be with someone that was super aggressive with them out the gate. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's kind of what can be really tricky and really concerning. No one is going to show up on a first date with like a tag monster on their shirt. (laughs) If they did, you wouldn't stay on the date. So it can start really nice and really sweet and then it can escalate from there. So you might have something like guilting. Guilting is another one that can be really slick, Mm -hmm. right? Making you feel responsible for their actions or making you feel like it's your job to keep them happy. Mm. So why didn't you respond to my text right away? Or had you done this, then I wouldn't have had to do that or I wouldn't feel this way. So we're like, it's not just an action that you're doing, but you are responsible for their emotional well-being. Not them. You are responsible Mm -hmm. for the way that they feel. You are to blame. You are to blame. Exactly. Exactly. So those are two. What are some of the other ones? You said a few other examples before, but maybe we can run through those because I like the examples. It definitely helps put it into perspective. For sure. One of the first ones you'll see is isolation. Mm -hmm. So again, when someone's keeping Mm -hmm. you away from your friends, family, or other people, isolating you is a really useful thing because taking you away from your community, from your supports, makes you dependent on that partner. It also makes you feel more alone than you already feel. So oftentimes when you talk to people who have been in unhealthy relationships, they just feel a lot of shame and a lot of like, no one else is going through this. I'm the only one. Mm, Yeah, They feel very singular in their experience. And so taking you away from your community, there's no one to reflect back to you. It's not you. What you're going through is not okay. It's not normal. You don't have to be going through it. The person who's acting unhealthily towards you does not want people saying those things to you. So what they'll do is try to convince you that your friends aren't your friends, Mm -hmm. that your family does doesn't like them, that they're out to get them, um, that your family or your friends don't understand you. Yeah. Right. If you have maybe some tension between a friend or a family member, they'll try to like exacerbate that tension. Right. So that you start to think like, oh yeah, you're right. That friend isn't a good friend to me. Or that family member, my whole life has never treated me right. This person, this partner is the person that treats me right. They're the person that understands me. Yeah. It's us against the world. And again, that can be really confusing because what does it feel like when you first start dating someone? Right. It's so heady and yummy mm-hmm. and it does, you want to just, you want to be with them. Once that happens, now you are a complete human being, et cetera, et cetera. To that one, Abella, I feel like I have to confess, I've definitely made some comments about my partner's friends who I think are not good for him. Am I exhibiting signs of an unhealthy partner? So here's what I think is a healthy way to approach friends that you might be concerned about. Asking your partner how those friends make your partner feel. Mm, Opposed to saying your own opinion. Exactly. What purpose is that friend serving for your partner? It might be a childhood friend that they've known since forever. And it's like, listen, like I've known this person since we were seven and maybe they're not like the best person ever, but I'm not going to quit this relationship. It's been too long. Getting curious about what that friendship does or serves for your partner is really important so you can understand and what is meaningful to them, right? And mm-hmm. then getting really clear with yourself about what it is you don't like about that person, that friend. And is that a you problem 
Or is that like a genuine problem? Mm. Yeah. And it's also like the isolation, right? It's like there's one thing of stating that you don't like someone versus like saying like you cannot be around this person. That's a very big thing. So I had a friend, I remember, it's kind of what you were saying earlier, at the beginning of a relationship, this does tend to happen that people kind of get obsessed with their partners and fall off the face of the universe. (laughs) And it's not ideal when people do it, but sometimes people do it. So when that happened, we all just assumed that that was what was going on. Mm-hmm. And then I think like a year later, we found out that she was in a very unhealthy relationship yeah. where mm. this guy was borderline abusive yeah. and, mm. you know, had this whole thing that he was trying to isolate her. But like as friends, we did not know that because clearly that was like part of why he was keeping her away from people. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you deal with that if you have a friend in that situation? Or like, if you are that person, how do you differentiate between like, oh, my partner doesn't like to go out and I want to spend time with my partner versus now I'm isolated? Well, Julie, I think something that you said was really key. We all assumed that it was just the pettiness of a new relationship. And I don't know if any of you guys checked if your assumption was correct, but I think that would be a step, right? Something that we do is we assume Mm -hmm. people's emotions or their feelings. We assume that new relationships are all great. It's honeymoon phase. And so we don't ask. Right. We don't say, how are things going? Mm. How does this person make you feel? Hey, I haven't seen you around in a bit. Would love to see you. When we just assume that... That it's like, oh, okay, they're doing the thing that all annoying new couples do. <laughs> and we don't ask, then you do run the risk of a year later being like, oh my gosh, wait, that was what was going on. Right. And the friend then is either not knowing that they're being isolated until maybe it's too late, till the isolation is so deep that they feel like it's been so long since I've reached out to my friends, I can't reach out. Right. Or I'm embarrassed to admit that I've allowed myself to be in this situation, right? So I want to distribute responsibility. Of course, your friend hopefully would feel secure and free enough to reach out to you. But when you're in that situation, that's kind of the point. You don't feel secure. Mm. You don't feel free enough to reach out. And so it's on all of us as friends to be checking in with our friends when the relationship looks good as much as when the relationship doesn't look so good. Mm -hmm. That's really key. Yeah. Sometimes as friends, you feel like you don't want to just butt in, Mm -hmm. right? You don't want to stir the pot, but there are signs that we can be looking out for, like the ones that you had mentioned. As the person in the relationship though, what is the line between, oh, these are just the initial funkiness of Mm. being in a new relationship. We're just navigating different communication styles, love languages, et cetera, versus this is an actual unhealthy, at-risk relationship. I want to say two things. One about the friend thing, just really quickly to wrap that up. Mm -hmm. When you approach a friend, you're going to want to address behavior right? So you're going to want to say, hey, I haven't seen you around in a while and you used to love going to game night and I haven't seen you at game night in a long time. Mm. How does that make you feel? Or do you miss it? Or do you think you'll be coming back? At any kind of like open-ended yeah. opportunity to give you feedback rather than, gosh, you're, it's always you and your partner. Or like, can't you see what they're doing? Or, you know, whatever. Like, yeah. oh, your partner's such trash. Yeah, like, that's not good. That's not good, but it's so tempting to do. Mm-hmm. And especially if you missed your friend and you're frustrated, you're like, man, it's so obvious, blah, 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 right? Like you want to be like, like, hey, I noticed that you get really nervous around your phone and you always have to respond to your partner right away. How is everything going? Mm. Right? How do you yourself know if this is mismatched love languages or if this is an actual relationship for concern? One, how do you feel? And get really honest with yourself and really clear with yourself. At One Love, we say a lot, trust your gut. And it sounds so easy, but there are 10 million ways from birth to today that we have been taught not to trust our gut. Mm. We have been taught, don't rock the boat. Don't make people uncomfortable. You're full. No, you're not full. Clean that plate. Finish all your food. We have been taught to defer to authority. We have been taught not to trust ourselves. Trusting your gut, your body is giving you critical information. And so if you are in a partnership, if you are talking to someone and there is a rumbling in your stomach or it's your palms, right? Ask yourself where you feel things in your body and start listening to that. Number two is a partner should listen to you and respect boundaries. If you're being made to feel small or that what you want is unreasonable 
or there's no compromise ever, you are always doing what the other person wants, right? If your boundaries aren't being respected, if you're afraid to say boundaries. Now there's one thing, boundaries are awkward. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's a difference between, I don't know how to express this boundary or it's uh, it's so cringy to express this boundary versus I am afraid to express this boundary because I do not know how it's going to be received. Mm -hmm. And my hunch is that it's going to be received poorly. These are different things now. This isn't like, oh, you like words of affirmation and I like gifts. You know, like these these are like, how do you feel in your body? (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's a deal breaker. So So I want to go back to something you were saying before of how there's always going to be signs of healthy and unhealthy in a relationship. Yes. I'm just thinking about like myself and, you know, we've only gone to three of them so far, but I was raised Jewish. Guilting is in our DNA. And I definitely... (laughs) Asians. <laughs> and I definitely think I do that sometimes. And it's not on purpose. It's just sometimes happens. I would say of the 10, that's probably like the one I would say that I do. But like, what's the line of there's always going to be something versus now it's an unhealthy relationship? Yes, Julie, but you're aware of it. Are you trying to do it less? Mm. Yeah, definitely. That's a healthy thing, right? That you are trying to do it less. Do you think your partner feels comfortable calling you out when you're guilting? No, but I think we can work on that. But you could work on it. You're open to working on it. <laughs> You're open to working on it. Yes, yes. send him this episode right away. <laughs> like I'm going through like a checklist in my head of things that you can be like, okay, has the behavior been identified? Has it been communicated? Is there a willingness to work on the behavior? None of us are perfect. We all do unhealthy things. So we're all in good company with each other. But is there an openness and a desire and a genuine trying to work on it. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that, Julie, you're not going to feel justified and guilty from time to time, right? That this is like a go-to coping mechanism for you. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's just going to fall away, but you are willing to work on it. In an unhealthy relationship, your partner is willing to do none of those things. Mm. In fact, your partner is going to tell you that it's your problem. So it's not that you have to be perfect yourself. Like we're all going to mm-hmm. sometimes fall victim to you know bad, unhealthy behaviors, but how do you work with them? And to be honest, like I think this conversation conversation is making me more aware of some of it too. So it's good for people for sure. that are listening. If you obviously this is good for you to look out for red flags where people you date, but also maybe your own red flags. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What red flags do you bring to the table? Not just what are what are you looking for on the other side of the table, but what are you bringing to the we table? We all have red how- flags, don't we? Yes. <laughs> how can you start cleaning up your side of the street, my friend, and be the partner that your partner deserves as well, for sure. But again, it sits on this spectrum. And I think that sometimes when people hear the word unhealthy relationships, certainly when they hear the word abuse, they stop paying attention because they're like, well, that's not me. That would never be me. And and there's no part of that conversation that's relevant to me. When you look at the unhealthy signs, they start at a lowercase r red flag and then obviously go all the way up to the capital. But like volatility, when someone has really big, strong, unpredictable reactions that make you feel scared or confused. Used. Mm, Betrayal, when one. someone's disloyal or acts in an intentionally dishonest way. Mm-hmm. Deflecting responsibility is huge when someone repeatedly makes excuses for their unhealthy behavior. We'll hear that in terms of, oh, uh, you know, yeah, I drank too much or I had a bad day that day, right? Mm. These are reasons maybe for behavior, but they're not excuses sabotage when someone purposely ruins your reputation, achievements, or success. Mm. And then the last one is manipulation when someone tries to control your decisions, actions, or emotions. Did we talk about intensity? Sorry, I might have missed that one. Yeah. So intensity is like, being with this person, like it's like almost they take all the oxygen out of the room. Like it's uh-huh. just so intense and you're just like, oh, gosh, I just, it's a lot. It's a lot. Would love bombing fall in there? Absolutely. Like intensity? Okay. Absolutely. Love bombing is an unearned intensity of emotion. And it feels so good because we all deserve love. And so we don't think, oh, I didn't earn this. You're like, by being a human <laughs> being on this planet, I have earned all this affection and attention because it's what I've wanted my whole life. And frankly, it's what society has told me I should want and should have and what I should aspire to. Right. So when you start receiving love bombing, it just feels really good. Mm-hmm. But if you are truly honest, 
honest with yourself. This person's telling you like you're the sun, the moon, and the stars, but they've only known you for a few days. Like, did you really earn that? Like, how could they know yet that you're the sun, the moon, right. and the stars, right? Right. So there's, it's a disproportionate affection. Right. And then it gets quickly snatched away because the love bomber is not doing this because they know that you're the sun, the moon, and the stars. They want someone to affirm them. And right. once you start like affirming power. the love bomber, exactly. Once they start getting it, because they don't actually believe that they're lovable in the first place. And so once anyone starts loving them, then they get turned off by that person. They will, as quickly as they gave all that affirmation, they will take it away. And it's devastating. This is a really tricky one. It's a very tricky one because <laughs> I feel like a lot of daters we speak to would identify this as chemistry or connection. Yeah, we yeah. have such a strong connection, so intense. Yeah. And I can't find that again with someone else. How can we start drawing the line between, oh, that's true connection versus like, that's love bombing or that's intensity or volatility? Again, it's this unearned, unmerited thing. But in movies and television, it's like, yeah, no duh. That's why it's called chemistry. It's like, boom, yeah. like this, this magic thing comes Explosion. when two people meet. It's inexplicable. It is unearned because it's magical. Mm. Did you not hear me say the word chemistry, right? So <laughs> we've, been told, we've been told that that is what it is. And attraction requires that like heat, that like fast, mm. that is like attraction. And then like these long-term relationships are slower and it's a mm -hmm. slower burn and it's getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. But we need to get comfortable with the fact that things can take time and build and that getting to know someone is foundational. Communication is foundational. If you're having these like really intense feelings, but you don't really know anything about each other, mm. then that's a house of cards particularly coming out of the pandemic and all the ways that we isolated and how hard it is to meet someone wonderful. And so when you meet someone like that, yeah. of course you want to get swept up and right. all of that. That's like Tinder swindler, right? And like the scammers, <laughs> like they thrived off of intensity. That's exactly what they right. did. They built intensity right. and then they got what they wanted and that wasn't love. So love is built on a foundation. Again, I talked to you about the signs of unhealthy, but we have the signs of healthy too. And those things are trust and comfortable pace and independence yeah. from each other, right? And respect. And so those things need to be present as much as the unhealthy things need to not be present. Well, I definitely want to get mm. into those. But before we do, volatility, yep. the way I understand it, let me know if this is correct or not, is more like up and down. So like the on again, off again relationship or something that's good and then it's bad. Maybe it has periods of intensity and then mm -hmm. periods that are lows. Is that how you would describe it or differently? Sure. Yeah. So a relationship could be volatile and it'd be exactly what you described. A person can be volatile as well. Uh, okay. And so you, you never are, know what you're going to get. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. So you're like, okay, I'm not going to do X because last time X made them pop off, yeah. but you do Y and Y now makes them pop off. Right. And so you yeah. don't know. That's scary. You, it's very, very scary. It makes you feel scared. It makes you feel confused. It makes you feel intimidated. And it's meant to. You feel like you're walking on eggshells all the time. Exactly. Because you don't know yeah. what you're going to do to trigger them. We say involatile like, means like, I think it comes, connotes bigness. Mm -hmm. But again, I just want to always draw attention to the quiet volatility. Mm. Then you're like, oh shoot, I am in trouble. Yeah. Like that, like, I am not going to talk to you. I'm going to withhold affection. Yes. I'm going to withhold communication. And then you are going to pay for this. And so volatility can be quiet. <sighs> oh, the cold shouldering. Ooh. So I had a friend, I think what you described, describes her ex to the T, like very mm -hmm. volatile. And then mm -hmm. also belittling signs of that too. Yep. I think one of her challenges though, was that he came from a difficult upbringing and had a lot of trauma. Mm, so she yep. was always kind of justifying it in the sense like he just needs to work through things and mm -hmm. he's just loving the way he was loved. Mm -hmm. Like what's the line of like, you know, being there for your partner versus recognizing this isn't a good thing for me. Yeah. Versus being there for yourself, frankly. Yeah. You same questions that I asked you before, I would ask that person, has the partner identified the behavior as it maybe you have identified it? Do they agree? Or are they saying that it's your friend's problem, that they don't have a volatility problem, that they don't belittle, right? Are both of them on board with what's going on in this relationship? And is the partner who's behaving badly willing to change their behavior? 
So it all comes down to deflecting responsibility. Is that accurate? Because that sounds like you're like not accepting that this is, or is that something different? You can't be in relationship with someone who won't own what they're doing in the relationship. But I've also known relationships with a person will accept responsibility, Mm -hmm. but then just say, don't change. I'm working on it. Right. I'm yeah. working on it and right. just never there needs change. To be change. It's like, oh, I, you know, I, mm-hmm. I'm doing my thing. I'm doing the best I can, but they're not really changing. Yeah. So much of what we're talking about right now, you can apply this once you're in a relationship because there's a little back and forth. Mm-hmm. Is your partner working on these things? What about mm-hmm. early on, even mm-hmm. like in the texting stages of a relationship? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Can you spot these red flags? To an extent, you can catch these signs when you're just having those initial first texts or when you're just in the talking stage. And that might look like something like, do they respect your no? Mm. Just not accepting your no. Now, is there a world in which you tell a friend and they're like, oh my gosh, he just can't wait to see you. They just want to see you so much. I was going to say this. I was like, this is what we've been fed. It's like, oh, a green light. Like this person right? likes you. Oh my God, yes. They're going to forego getting a drink to go help you with your boring <sighs> presentation for Thursday. Like there is a world in mm-hmm. which we will spin that to be a good thing. But what is happening is mm-hmm. that person is not respecting your no. They're not respecting a boundary. Pay attention to that. This is a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> so then you say, okay, well, oh my gosh, if someone does it once, I just, well, I just cut them off. No, it just means pay attention. Does it happen again? So right. abuse is defined as recurrence of unhealthy behavior. We all do unhealthy things. Julie, sometimes you lean on the mm. guilting a little bit more than maybe you would like to. So there's a recurrence there, but we're working on it. But abuse is a recurrence of unhealthy behavior with no intention or desire to stop. Mm-hmm. I would say I also don't guilt that much. So that's a good, <laughs> that's a good thing to hear is that. <laughs> I feel like that's that's actually a good distinction, though, because I was thinking about that when you were running down these. Like, what is the line of, like, working to understand your partner versus cutting and mm-hmm. running, right? If this sounds really mm-hmm. bad mm-hmm. for you. So repetitive mm-hmm. behavior. Like, what's that baseline? I know you can't say, like, five times or whatever, but, like, what is <laughs> that mean yeah. of like what you look out for? When is enough is enough? That's again, when we're checking in with ourselves, because yeah. someone might have a lower or higher threshold. How does this person's behavior make you feel? Let's hold that thought for a quick message. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATABLE at OseaMalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over for $60. So head to OSEAMalibu.com and use the code DATABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. Living with ADHD can be a challenge and dating with ADHD is definitely a challenge. We've heard many of you say, but finding the right care and proper tools needed to succeed can be life-changing. Done is an online ADHD care platform that can get you all the resources you need to help manage your ADHD. Online visits, refills, and a 24-7 care team made for you. In just one minute, Dunn's online assessment can help kickstart your ADHD treatment journey. With experienced clinicians, worry fill refills, and online visits, you can start getting personalized care as soon as today or tomorrow. So contact an expert team that can help you around the clock and get a personalized treatment plan just for you. Here's how you do it. 
take a free one-minute assessment and book an appointment with a licensed ADHD clinician as soon as the next day. Get continuous care, one-click refills, insurance coverage, and 24-7 care team support with Done for just $79 a month. And pharmacy co-pays as low as $0. Visit get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. That's get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. Done. Turn ADHD into your strength. So one of the challenges we have that we see daters facing is you want to get ahead of all these red flags and you're on this red flag hunt on dating, which doesn't make dating a fun place to be. And also we established everyone has some red flags. If you're going to go out looking for it, you're going to find something. How do you balance not looking at everything as a red flag versus being aware of some of these unhealthy signs you mentioned? So you want to go into a date knowing what are the most important red flags for you. That's, I think, the first thing is you want to do some self-exploration, what's important to you, what's okay, what's not okay. And you go into the date or the experience with that in mind. So you're not looking for everything. You're looking for specific things. What happens is we tend to discount small things. We say, oh, that's probably in my head Mm -hmm. or that's probably not a big deal. And you have to really, no one else is going to hold firm to your boundary other than you, right? And so if you see something in a person and you've told yourself you don't like that thing, then you really need to pay attention to that, get curious about it. And I'm not saying you should discount someone because they do one thing, but if it's like a major deal breaker for you, you should pay attention to that. Those unhealthy signs live on a spectrum and they are happening on the small end as much as they're happening on the big end. And so we want to be mindful of those things. What's an example of something that like starts as the small red flag, Mm -hmm. like the lowercase r, and then escalates into the big red flag? Yeah. So if someone doesn't respect your boundary, so say you said that you can't have plans on Wednesday and they say to you, oh, come on, I'll have you home early. And you're like, well, no, I actually really, I have to, oh, come on, Wednesday is my only day I'm free. They are showing you that they are blowing past your boundary, that they're not hearing your no. And there's a world in which you tell a friend and that friend might be like, oh my gosh, they want to see you so badly. <laughs> they still tried to make it work. They said, they would have it be an early night. They said just one drink. They just want to hang out with you so badly. I mean, that's, I I wish someone liked me that much, right? (laughs) And no one's saying, no, that's kind of messed up. Like you told this person, no, what you want doesn't matter. So that's an example of something that's happening, like just still in the texting or maybe even still on the app phase where they're not listening to you. They're not honoring your boundary. Right. And there's such a subtle difference sometimes when we're in a relationship to see the difference between constructive criticism and belittling. Right. Because in a relationship, your relationship should make you feel good about yourself and it should build you up. Yeah. And also love is expansive. I like to say whenever I'm talking to people or teaching on this, I'm like, love is like a rubber band that stretches and stretches and never breaks. It's a balloon that can like blow up and blow up and never pop. It fits everything. It fits all your friends. It fits all your interests. It fits the things you're into today and the things that you will be into tomorrow. And anyone that tells you that, oh, there's no room for this or there's no room for that, there's no room for this part of your personality or these people, they are not talking about love. That is not a function Mm. of love because love is expansive. Mm. And what unhealthy people do is they try to shrink you. They try to shrink your life. They try to shrink your light. And it's all about making you small. So when you talk about constructive criticism versus belittling, constructive criticism is maybe improv is not your strong suit. You know, like maybe like you go to a show (laughs) and you know, but bless your heart for trying. And if you want to keep doing improv, I will keep showing up to these shows. Right. But like (laughs) maybe we think about something else that's loving and constructive and funny. Right. It's like a little, it's a playful jab or it's a like, it's like you should still have a thing, right. You should still have a thing. Maybe it's not improv, but you should still have a thing versus belittling or shrinking your, it's like, you were so embarrassing and you actually embarrassed me. Mm. It's not like, oh, what else could you do? That's like, you shouldn't do anything. You shouldn't try. You shouldn't put yourself out there. You should just be small and worry about how your actions affect me. It's like an yes and is constructive criticism and belittling is no, 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah>. No <laughs> period. Exactly. Yeah. So we talk about, you know, not all unhealthy relationships are abusive, but all abusive relationships start unhealthy. What's the line that like makes something go from unhealthy to abusive? Abuse is repetitive. It's an unhealthy action that happens with frequency. So we all do unhealthy things from time to time. There are one-off things that we'll do. There are one-off things that we'll experience. That doesn't mean, you know, burn the whole house down. That means let's have a conversation. Let's figure out how to repair the harm, et cetera. Abuse is when an unhealthy behavior happens repetitively. And then we're also going to see a pattern of escalation. It's going to start as a snide comment. It typically will start as verbal or emotional, and it can escalate then too physical. But it doesn't mean, and what I really don't want people to hear is, it only registers as abuse if it gets physical. Mm -hmm. That is not right. the case at all. There's absolutely emotional abuse and verbal abuse, and your situation may only include verbal or emotional abuse. It may never get physical. And then when do you think is the right time to seek professional help? Because I can also hear people saying, well, it's just a little bit abusive right now. I have tolerance for it. I'm going to work through it. Is that the right way to look at it? It is always the right time to talk to someone, whether it's a friend, whether it's a professional, it's always the right time. And let's just even get curious about that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. I can tolerate this. It's only just this right? That's mm -hmm. not okay. Mm -hmm. You deserve mm -hmm. a relationship that makes you feel good about yourself, not one that you can tolerate. Right. Is there any way that you can work through it with an abusive partner? Or is it kind of like a lost cause because this person, by definition, kind of isn't going to work through it? There are certain things that are literally lethality factors, right? So if you are mm -hmm. in a situation where the abuse is escalating to the point where someone has choked you, there is a gun in the home. Like these are things that are like big lethality factors. So if you're in a situation like that, you're going to want to get out. There are a lot of things like right. the National Domestic Violence Hotline. You can go to joinonelove.org to seek out help, right? Those are really big, serious, take this serious immediately situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, short of that then, let's talk about what is salvageable. At One Love, we talk about if your relationship is unhealthy, talk to your partner. If your partner is doing something that feels unhealthy that you don't like. And again, I'm not just talking about your like, committed, monogamous relationship. I'm talking about whatever dynamic you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. Talk to that person. If something bothers you, bring it up. If you feel like you can't bring it up, not just because it's awkward and you got to kind of work up courage, <laughs> but if you genuinely are fearful of not even maybe for physical, but like that the person will lash out at you or dismiss you, laugh at you, tell you it's your fault. If those things are happening and you're scared to bring up a need in a relationship, pay attention to that. But if you can bring up an issue with an unhealthy partner and they are willing to work with you on that behavior and you're seeing that they are working, either they're getting into therapy, mm. they're actually changing their behaviors. Maybe they're not hanging out with the same people that they used to that were influencing them. Maybe there was some drug or alcohol use that they're cutting back on, like whatever it is, right? Like if they're making changes that you can see, then that's great because we are ever evolving people and, and there's always hope. If you are asking, if you're bringing something up and you're not seeing any changes, if you're being dismissed, et cetera, then those things may not be salvageable. And much of it should be being done with the help of a professional. I think having professional help is something that people don't think about earlier on, on the mm -hmm. spectrum, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to know that there are resources for people to tap into. I can hear some other people saying, I constantly find myself in a pattern of unhealthy relationships, yeah. mm -hmm. sometimes borderline abusive. Is there something wrong with me? Why am I attracting mm -hmm. this kind of relationship? How can people break out of the cycle? I do want to say one thing about getting help. Do you hear people say, oh, if you have to get help or if you have to bring in a professional while you're just, quote unquote, just dating, then the relationship's doomed? Yes. Oh, yeah. I hear that all the time. Yeah. All the time. And yeah. it can't be further from Could the truth, be further but that's from the, the connotation that it has. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. So I just want to, I just want to put that to bed. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you find yourself dating the same type of person, you're going to want to bring in a professional because you're going to need to do some inner child work. You're going to want to look at family systems. You're going to want to look at the narrative that you have about relationships. 
it might even be that you equate love with chaos Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. so like if someone is chaotic or if if your relationship is stable and smooth, it really freaks you out. Right. It might be a a deservedness thing. Like maybe you feel like this is what you deserve Mm -hmm. because this is what you've experienced. So past will be present, will be future, and nothing can be further from the truth. Your past does not have to dictate your future. There are a number of reasons why people find themselves in a pattern of relationship. And it's really about doing the inner work to figure out what that pattern is and then breaking it. So how do you start to recover and find healthy relationships? We've talked so much about (laughs) unhealthy signs. What are some signs? And especially, let's say you're someone that has had a slew of unhealthy relationships. What are some things that you should start to be looking out for? At One Love, we have something called the 10 signs of healthy relationships as well. So not just what you should be running away from, but it's important to think about what am I running towards? What kind of life am I trying to build? What kind of relationship am I trying to build? Mm. And with these 10 signs, you can really think about, okay, what are the ones that are most valuable to me? They're all wonderful, but what are the ones that I prioritize? So some of the 10 signs of a healthy relationship are comfortable pace, that the relationship is moving at a speed that feels enjoyable for each person. Trust that you are confident that your partner won't do anything to hurt you or ruin the relationship. Honesty is very important. You can be truthful and candid without fear. Independent Independence is a big one, you know, that you have space to yourself outside of the relationship. Like I was talking about, love is expansive. It can fit you being away from your partner and having your own interests. Respect is huge. You value each other's beliefs and opinions. Equality, the relationship feels balanced, right? That everyone's putting in the same effort for the success of the relationship. And that leads to taking responsibility. We talked a lot about deflecting responsibility, giving excuses for mm-hmm. things, but taking responsibility is owning your actions and your words. And then we want your partner to be kind to you, right? That they're caring and empathetic. You provide comfort and support to each other and that the relationship is fun. I think if you <laughs> ask people- we Forget that sometimes. It's supposed to be yes. fun. It's yeah. supposed to be fun. <laughs> You're supposed to enjoy spending time. You are supposed to bring out the best in each other. Right. I know I have personally done this. I have friends who have done this. You spend time with someone who does not bring out the best in you. In fact, they bring out the worst in you. Your relationship should be fun. And finally, the last sign is something that people will often scrunch their nose at because it's healthy conflict. And they're like, what do you, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Conflict yeah. is awful. Yeah. How could it be healthy? But it's wildly important that we are not conflict avoidant, but it doesn't mean that it's unhealthy. It means that it's really good. Both people are bringing their needs to the table and you're compromising and you're negotiating and you're getting through to the other side because you value the relationship more than you value your individual rightness, being right or whatever it is. I'm so glad you're putting these into words because I think I want to make this very important point. People can articulate what they're not looking for, but they (laughs) don't understand what they're looking for and how that would make them feel. So for example, I had a friend who said, I don't want a possessive boyfriend. I had a possessive boyfriend who got jealous very easily. And then she got entered into a relationship where the guy was like, go out with your friends, come back whenever you want. I'm totally confident in you. And she was like, he doesn't care about me. He's not asking. Mm, He's not jealous. He's not asking about who I'm hanging out with. I don't feel good in this relationship. So it's a green flag she didn't consider in this situation. How would that even look like? So the green flag in here is confidence in your relationship. She was only focused on the red flag. So I'm glad we're putting some words around what the green flags are. I love that story. My role at One Love is to create content and tools for people to think through what they want in relationship and what they don't want. And so one of the things that Mm -hmm. we're going to release in February are conversation starters. So just questions to ask yourself. You could ask them with the person you're dating or talking to, or you can journal about them, whether you're in a relationship or not. You can just kind of have these answers in your head. So like as your friend, like if they had thought like, oh, my green flag is confidence, then going into that relationship, they're looking for confidence. Again, we Mm -hmm. don't want to go into a relationship or a date or whatever it is looking for red flags. We want to go in there looking for the green flags and like, oh yeah, okay. Yes. Oh, I, I see you confidence. Yeah. Or I see you yep. kindness or I see you whatever it is, right? We're working on this conversation document. So for trust, That's one of great. the conversation starters might be, what are the things you need in order to trust someone? I love that so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? 
many people are like, trust is earned. Okay, great. Well, what are the things that you need? And then you could be looking mm-hmm. out for those things. We don't things. define anything. No. We never take the step to define it. And I think like, honestly, that brings me to takeaways because this conversation has been <laughs> so enlightening. So, I mean, honestly, you and I, we're both like, oh, we learned a lot from this about how yeah. maybe we're <laughs> showing up or how things could show up differently. And I think the big first one is we always expect that we need to be 100% healthy Mm. to have a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. The reality is that we're human, right? Like that we're not always going to be 100% healthy. We may even display some of these unhealthy signs from time to time. But what makes it healthy is can you adapt? Can you learn from it? Can you keep going with your partner? What makes it unhealthy is when you're stubborn and stuck in your way, unwilling to listen and to work with that person at all. So I think that was like an eye-opening moment for me and hopefully for a lot of our listeners that there's this reassurance that they don't have to be perfect. The people they don't date don't have to be perfect, but how do you work together? The other big part is like society has fed so many of these narratives that actually glamorize unhealthy Mm -hmm. behaviors. Yes, And we need to unlearn so much of it. Like the story (laughs) you, you were just sharing about the jealousy, right? It's like we're told like, like, if someone likes us, they're going to be jealous. Like, that yep. actually is not what we want it's at terrible. all. Terrible. Yeah. Yes. So, we have to look at like, where is this stuff coming from? And I love what we were just talking about, too, of how do we get more clear about what we need? Mm. And that goes beyond these like buzzwords, high level. Mm-hmm. And how do we start looking for the green flags? We yes. always talk about red flags. And I think red flags are important. I almost feel like they're so important and we have swung so far in looking for them that we actually like minimize the importance of real red flags. Mm -hmm. So we hear people like say like, oh, it's a red flag if they chew with their mouth open. It's like, no, that's not the same thing (laughs) as like if they're like belittling you, right? So it's like, I want people to take away from this that it's not that you can't not have red flags that you're looking for. Like, I think getting clear of what the red flags are that are like the ultimate deal breakers for you is a good step. Mm -hmm. But how do we also relinquish control of some of these ones that aren't real red flags? And then also, how do we focus more on the green flags of the behaviors that we want to see? And not to say that we're not going to pay attention to the red flags. If we see something, we bring it up, we take note, the data part that you were talking about of these data points. Like, is this something that's reoccurring? And talk to your partner. So often we talk to our friends, we talk Hmm. to anyone but our partner, or we bottle it up inside and don't tell anyone. Yeah. I think for me, the biggest red flag of a relationship is not being able to share things with your partner. So that should be a sign in itself if you're feeling that way. Or not being able to tell your friends because you're ashamed. Like there's some shame there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Two big takeaways for me. One is abuse comes in many different shapes and forms. And it's a spectrum of abusive behavior that we can exhibit or see in a relationship. And I think it's easy for us to say, well, I haven't been abused physically, so I haven't been in an abusive relationship. But now looking back in my relationship history, I've definitely been in one or two abusive relationships just thinking, that's not abuse. That's just a bad match. Yeah, same. So I think it's important to recognize that and to know their resources to help us out of abusive relationships. Relationships. And the second biggest takeaway I have is that we look at dating as a checklist. We're looking for X, Y, and Z, and we're looking for a partner. But what if our checklist becomes symptoms of healthy mm-hmm. a relationship mm-hmm. and symptoms of an unhealthy relationship so we can properly diagnose our relationships? I think when we start recognizing the symptoms in one way or the other, we can triage them accordingly. But if we have a checklist, it's much easier to have someone meet your checklist Mm -hmm. and still be in abusive relationship or unhealthy relationship. So healthy is actually quite the goal to have when you first start dating someone. Mm -hmm. And maybe an early date question is, What do you think are signs of a healthy relationship? I I think that's a great question to ask someone you're involved with. So, (laughs) (laughs) woo, a lot. Okay, well, we'll go down the list of 100 more takeaways, but we won't take up any more time (laughs) on this episode. Thank you so much, Abella, for being on our show. Thank you to the One Love Foundation for providing the resources for unhealthy and abusive relationships. If people want to learn more about you and your work, where can they find you? 
You can find us online at joinonelove.org and you can find us on social at join the number one love. And all of our material is free. It's all there for you all. We want as many people to have this information, to know about the 10 signs, all the tools. And we're talking about queer relationships and digital relationships and relationships in race and relationships in disability. Like All of these tools are on the website. We just scratched the surface. So if we can be helpful to anyone that is listening, we want to be, and we don't want price to be an issue at all. So all of it is downloadable for free. Fantastic. We love it. I mean, that's why we've been such proponents of One Love. (laughs) I think the content that you're putting out there is so helpful. Definitely want to download what you were talking about earlier about the more journaling exercises too. Yes, the conversation starters. Be on the lookout for that. so much. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you again. And to our fabulous listeners, thanks for listening to this episode. I'm sure you learned a thing or two. Why don't you give us a rating and review? And then in your (laughs) review, tell us what you learned. What are, what's like one sign of a healthy relationship that you've learned from this episode? Let's go there. Yeah, let's, (laughs) we want to learn from you while you learn from us and five stars while you're at it. That definitely helps us uh, be in a healthy (laughs) podcast relationship with you all. (laughs) And with that, we're going to wrap up this episode. Stay dateable. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Media Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at Dateable Podcast and visit datablepodcast.com for access to all the episodes and our premium programs. Also, make sure to subscribe today if you haven't already on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. So you are the first to get all the latest episodes. And most importantly, stay dateable. Stay dateable.